and welcome back to our lifelong learning series. My name is Anna McCoy and I'm the Fulton County Family and Consumer Science Agent and we're going to talk today about coffee time. Coffee time, exploring a favorite beverage. Did you know after crude oil, coffee is the most sought after commodity in the world? So one of the things I love is trivia. So some coffee trivia for you. The name cappuccino comes from A, the drink's resemblance to the brown cows worn by Capuchin monks, the similarity in color to the fur of Capuchin monkeys, C, the Italian puccino, meaning light brown one, or D, the size of cup in which it's commonly served. So the answer is A, the word comes from the resemblance of the drink to the coloring of the Capuchin monks. Their brown tunics appear similar in color to the frothy drink we all know and love. So the next trivia question is espresso literally means A, speed it up, to go, forced out, or black and intense. So the answer is C. In Italian, the word espresso literally means when something is forced out. Kopi Luwak, the world's most expensive cup of coffee, coffee up to 600 per pound, is A, processed during a full moon, brewed only with solid gold pots, made from coffee beans eaten and then excreted by a Sumatran wildcat, grown in a higher altitude than any other bean. So the answer is C. It is the beans excreted, excreted by a Sumatran wildcat. You may be wondering why people would pay so much for wildcat poo, and I'm here to tell you that I personally don't know. The beans are only partially digested and then stripped of their outer layer and thoroughly cleaned before being brewed. Those who have tried it say the flavor is very smooth, sweet, and earthy with a slight chocolate taste. And so the last question is, the country that drinks the most coffee is... Finland, Sweden, Iceland, or Norway. So the people of Finland consume the most coffee. Other Nordic countries such as Sweden, Iceland, Norway, and Denmark closely follow suit. Believe it or not, Finnish coffee drinkers sip nearly three times as much coffee as the average American. And also on that list, um, Canada is number 10 and USA is actually number 25 on the list, which I found really interesting. All right, so the objective, the goal of this session is to provide research-based information about coffee. After participating in this session, you will be aware of the differences among coffee roasts, nutritional content, the potential health benefits and risks associated with coffee consumption. And then also I'll show you some recipes at the end. So a little history behind coffee. No one knows exactly how or when coffee was discovered, though there are many legends about its origin. So it all starts um, with an Ethiopian legend. Coffee grown worldwide can trace its heritage back to centuries to the ancient coffee forest on the Ethiopian plateau. Their legend says the goat herder Kaudi first discovered the potential of these beloved beans. The story goes that Kaudi was discovered coffee after he noticed that after eating the berries from a certain tree, his goats became so energetic that they did not want to sleep at night. Kaudi reported his findings to the abbot of a local monastery who made a drink with the berries and found that it kept him alert though through the long hours of evening prayer. The abbot shared his discovery with the other monks at the monastery and the knowledge of the energizing berries began to spread. As word moved east and coffee reached the Arabian Peninsula, it began a journey which would bring these beans across the globe. So then it goes to the Arabian Peninsula where coffee cultivation and trade began on the peninsula. By the 15th century, coffee was being grown in the um, district of Arabia, and by the 16th century, it was known in Persia, Egypt, Syria, and Turkey. Coffee was not only enjoyed in homes, but also in many public coffee houses. So coffee comes to Europe. In European travelers, European travelers to the Near East brought back stories of an unusual dark black beverage. By the 17th century, coffee had made its way to Europe and was becoming popular across the continent. In the mid-1600s, coffee was brought to New Amsterdam, later called New York by the British. Though coffee houses rapidly began to appear, tea continued to be the favored drink in the New World until 1773, when the colonists revolted against a heavy tax on the tea imposed by tea King George III 
The revolt known as the Boston Tea Party would forever change the American drinking preference to coffee. So what is coffee? Enjoying a cup of coffee or more provides important longevity and protective benefits. Coffee is a widely consumed beverage, and coffee beans are the seeds of the fruit that grow on the coffee bush, also known as coffee cherries. Coffee cherries grow along the branches of coffee trees, and it takes them over a year to mature and about five years of growth to reach its full production. The fruit is harvested when the color, of a, the color is a certain shade of red. Coffee plants can live up to 100 years. The average coffee tree produces 10 pounds of coffee cherry per year. The trees grow best in rich oil with mild temperatures, frequent rain, and shaded sun. The beans are removed from the fruit and dried before they can be roasted. All commercially grown coffee is grown in the coffee belt region. So here is a graphic of the anatomy of a coffee cherry. The coffee cherry's outer skin is called the exocarp. Beneath it is the mesocarp and a thin layer of pulp followed by a slimy layer called the parenchyma. The beans themselves are covered in a paper-like envelope named, named the endocarp, more commonly referred to as the parchment. Inside the parchment, side by side, lie two beans, each covered separately by yet another thin membrane. Um, in about 5% of the world's coffee, there is only one bean inside the cherry. This is called a pea berry, and it's a natural mutation. Some people believe that pea berries are actually sweeter and more flavorful than standard beans, so they are sometimes manually sorted out or special sale. So there are two main types of coffee beans. Um, the first one is Arabica. It grows best in steep terrain and high elevations. It requires mild temperatures and represents 70% of the world production. Arabica beans is descended from the original coffee trees discovered in Ethiopia. These trees produce a fine, mild, aromatic coffee and represents Again, approximately 70% of the world's coffee production. The beans are flatter and more elongated than Robusta and lower in caffeine. So most of the world's Robusta, the other beaten type, is grown in Central and Western Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, and Vietnam, and in Brazil. Production of Robusta is increasing, though it accounts for only 30% of the world market. Robusta is primarily, primarily used in blends and for instant coffee. So this is just a graphic of coffee from around the world. Um, there's a lot of different ones. You'll see there's um, ones from Vietnam, Italy, a few from America, one from Germany. So coffee around the world. All commercially grown coffee is from a region of the world called the Coffee Belt. The trees grow from Robust, enriched soil with mild temperatures, frequent rain, and shaded sun. The ideal conditions for coffee trees to thrive are found around the world along the equatorial zone called the Bean Belt. Coffee is grown in more than 50 countries worldwide. So we're going to talk a little bit about those countries. North America and the Caribbean, we have the United States. Coffee is grown in Hawaii. Um, though coffee farms are found throughout the Hawaiian Islands, it is Kona coffee from the large island of Hawaii that is best known and always in high demand. Kona coffee is carefully processed to create a deliciously rich, aromatic cup of the medium, of medium body. And um, next we have Mexico. Small Mexican coffee farms are more common than large plantations, but there, with over 100,000 coffee farmers, Mexico ranks as one of the largest coffee producing countries in the world. We have Puerto Rico. Coffee was brought to Puerto Rico in 1736. And by the late 19th century, the island was the sixth leading exporter of coffee. But with weather conditions and major hurricanes, um, they had to go away, uh, do away with the coffee. But today, the coffee industry is being revived with carefully cultivated coffee from quality Arabica varieties that are produced in high standards. Um, so in Central America, we have Guatemala. Um, it's not as well known as other countries, um, but coffee from Guatemala has a distinctive taste quality um, favored by many for its rich flavor. Um, we also have Costa Rica. Costa Rica produces only wet processed Arabicas with its medium body and sharp acidity. It is often described as having perfect balance. Um, next, you have South America, which we have Colombia. Colombia is probably the world's best known coffee producer and ranks second worldwide in yearly production. A high standard of excellence is maintained with great pride and careful growing on thousands of small 
family farms across the country. Brazil is the biggest coffee producing country in the world. Both Arabica and Robusta are grown. A fine cup of Brazilian is clear, sweet, medium bodied, and low acid. Next, we have Africa. Um, you have East Africa with Ethiopia, where the coffee legend tells the discovery of the first coffee trees in Ethiopia. Um, Kenyan coffee in Kenya is well known and well liked both in the United States and Europe. Um, we have West Africa with the Ivory Coast. Um, the Ivory Coast is one of the world's largest producer of robust coffee. And um, this variety is ideally suited for a darker roast, so they're usually often used in espresso blends. Next, we have the Arabian Peninsula. You have Yemen. In the country where coffee was first commercially cultivated, coffee is still grown in the age-old century-proven manner. Um, next, we have Asia. So there's a few countries in Asia. We have Indonesia. It's one of the world's largest countries. Um, it's composed of thousands of islands. Um, next, we have Vietnam. Coffee originally came to Vietnam in the mid-19th century from French missionaries. And they brought over Arabica trees from the island of Bourbon and planted them around Tonkin. More recently, coffee has been reintroduced and the coffee industry is growing so rapidly that Vietnam is becoming one of the world's largest producers. So next, we're going to talk about um, the 10 steps from seed to cup. So first, you have planting. Um, a coffee bean is actually a seed. When dried, roasted, and ground, it's used to brew coffee. If the seeds isn't processed, it can be planted and grown into a coffee tree. So next, you have harvesting the cherries. Depending on the variety, it will take approximately three to four years for the newly planted coffee trees to bear fruit. The fruit called the coffee cherry turns a bright, deep red when it's ripe and ready to be harvested. Um, next, you have processing the cherries. Once the process has once the coffee has been picked, processing must begin as quickly as possible to prevent fruit spoilage. Depending on location and local resources, coffee is processed in two ways. So your first method is the dry method. It's the oldest and the easiest, dried on mats in the sun, used where water is limited. And the next is wet method. It has several steps that include removing the pulp, separating it, fermenting, rinse, dry, and holing. Um, it also uses lots of water. The key difference between the wet and dry methods of coffee bean production is that the wet method removes the pulp before drying. These unroasted coffee beans are known as green coffee. So drying the beans. These beans still inside the parchment envelope, which we call the endocarp, can be sun-dried by spreading them on drying tables or floors where they are turned regularly or they can be machine dried in large tumblers. The, drink, the dried beans are known as parchment coffee and are warehoused in jute or sisal bags until they are ready for export. So milling the beans. The before being exported, parchment coffee has to go through a lengthy process. Hulling machinery removes the parchment labor from wet processed coffee. Hulling dry processed coffee refers to removing the entire dried husk of the dried cherries. Polishing is an optional process where any silver screen, skin that remains on the beans after hulling is removed by machine. While polished beans are considered superior to unpolished ones, in reality, there's little difference between the two. Grading and sorting is done by size and weight, and beans are also reviewed for color flaws or other imperfections. Beans are sized by being passed through a series of screens. They are also sorted by using an air jet to separate heavy and light beans. Next is exporting the beans. The milled beans now referred to as green coffee are loaded onto ships and loaded in shipping containers or bulk shipped inside plastic lined containers. Next is my favorite, which would be tasting the coffee. Coffee is repeatedly tasted for quality and taste. The process is referred to as cupping and usually takes place in rooms specifically designed to facilitate the process. Samples from a variety of batches and different beans are tasted daily. Coffees are not only analyzed to determine their characteristics and flaw, but also for the purpose of blending different beans or creating the proper roast. An expert cupper can taste hundreds of samples of coffee in de a day and still taste the subtle differences between them. Roasting the coffee. Roasting transforms green coffee into the aromatic brown beans that we purchase in our favorite stores. Most roasting machines maintain a 
temperature of about 550 degrees Fahrenheit. The beans are kept moving throughout the entire process to keep them from burning. After roasting, the beans are immediately cooled either by air or water. Roasting is generally performed in the importing countries because freshly roasted beans must reach the consumer as quickly as possible. And last, you have grinding the coffee. Cut that. Next, you have grinding the coffee. The objective of a proper grind is to get the most flavor in a cup of coffee. How coarse or fine the coffee is ground depends on the brewing method. So for a cold brew, you want to use a coarser grind of coffee. And for espresso, you want to use a very fine grind of coffee. So brewing the coffee. To brew the perfect cup of coffee, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, be sure that all equipment is thoroughly clean between brewing. Any residue of coffee grinds can lead to a bitter taste. And um, the water used is important too. Always start with a cold, fresh, always start with cold, fresh water. Um, choose coffee beans as soon after they are roasted as possible and store them in a cool, dark location. So a little bit about decaffeinated coffee. 97% or more coffee is removed. An accident in 1905 swamped the shipment of coffee beans with sea salt, washing off the coffee. This aided in the development of modern decaffeinated methods in which 97% or more of coffee is removed from the bean. Decaffeinated coffee still tastes like coffee, but it has almost no caffeine in it. Decaf coffee still... Decaf coffee is not caffeine free. So a little bit about the coffee roast guide in the publication in the pub that we've provided um, has a little graphic for the um, coffee roast guide. But roasting is a heat process that turns coffee into fragrant dark brown beans we know and love. Green coffee means green coffee beans have no flavor and no aroma. It releases caffeine, which is the essence of coffee. So light roast, light brown in color, it's preferred for milder coffee varieties. It has the highest acidity and the most caffeine. The blends you would be looking for is cinnamon, half city, and light city. Going into medium roast, medium brown in color with a stronger flavor. It's slightly sweeter than light roast. It has a balanced flavor, aroma, and acidity. Um, those blends would be called city, American, and a well-known one, a breakfast blend. Next is the medium dark roast, which is rich, dark in color, slight bittersweet aftertaste, and that blend would be full city. Next is dark roast, produces shiny black beans and a significant bitterness. Darker the roast, the less acidity and contains the least amount of caffeine. Uh, those blends would be Italian, espresso, and French. And even though espresso is not a roast, I just put a little information about it, which is the most concentrated form of coffee it usually comes in a one ounce shot, has lots and lots of caffeine. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but it's used to make a lot of the coffee drinks that you may know and love. So here's a little roasting guide. What the heck is roasting type? So next, um, we come to talk about the things I love, coffee drinks. Um, so we're going to talk about hot and cold coffee drinks. Um, so starting out on the hot side, we have a flat white, which is uh, this Aussie born drink is basically a cappuccino without the foam or chocolate sprinkle. It's an espresso drink with steamed milk. Um, a latte, one of the most popular coffee drinks out there. Um, the latte is comprised of a shot of espresso and steamed milk with just a touch of foam. It can be ordered plain or with a flavor shot of anything from vanilla to pumpkin spice. Cappuccino is a latte made with more foam than steamed milk, often with a sprinkle of cocoa powder or cinnamon on top. Sometimes you can find variations that use cream instead of milk or ones that throw in a flavor shot as well. Next, you have the Americano with a similar flavor to black coffee. The Americano consists of an espresso shot diluted in hot water. Um, a pro tip, if you're making your own, pour the espresso first and add the hot water. Macchiato, which has become a very big staple in the con a coffee industry. The macchiato is another espresso-based coffee drink that has a small amount of foam on top. It's a happy medium between a cappuccino and a doppio. 
Cafe a lot is a perf is perfect for the coffee minimalist who wants a bit more flavor. Just add a splash of warm milk to your coffee and you're all set. So this is a little graphic that I love. It talks about cold coffee, um, iced coffee in the spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, that is that is one of my favorites is a, is a cold coffee. I'm going into those drinks. They have the uh, favored one, which is iced coffee. It's coffee with ice, typically served with a dash of milk, cream, or sweetener. Iced coffee is really as simple as that. Is that. Next, we have iced espresso. Like an iced coffee, iced espresso can be served straight or with a dash of milk, cream, or sweetener. You can also ice any specialty espresso-based drinks that we talked about before, the Americanos, macchiatos, lattes. Um, next is cold brew. It's the trendiest of the iced coffee bunch. Cold brew coffees are made by steeping coffee beans from anywhere to six to 36 hours, depending on how strong you would like your cold brew. Once the beans are done steeping, add cold milk or cream. A frappuccino, it's made famous by Starbucks. The frappuccino is blended iced coffee drink that is topped with whipped cream and syrup. But not all fraps are made the same. Watch out for coffee-free versions unless you're into that sort of thing. Next is nitro. It's a newer um, way to make coffee. It's a cold brew versus nitrogen bubbles, which equals a cold brew coffee with a frothy Guinness-like consistency. It's also poured via nitro tap, too. And then the last one was one I thought was pretty interesting. It's called a Mazagran. Um, Mazagran coffee is a cross between iced coffee, tea, and your favorite rum drink. You don't have to add rum if you don't want to. Um, it typically consists of espresso, lemon, sugar, and sometimes rum. So let's talk a little bit about the types of coffee makers that are out there. So you have the French press, which simply puts the coffee grounds in the French press, add hot water, eventually stir coffee or gently stir, cover, and let sit for two to four minutes, then push down the strainer to enjoy. Coffee made in a French press results in a pure, clean, and robust body cup of coffee. Next, you have the favored percolator that's been around for a few, many years. Um, to put it simply, percolators brew coffee by continuously pushing the boiling the hot water bubbles up into the coffee chamber to steep the coffee grains. This is this cycle is repeated until the coffee is ready to serve. Um, they're typically used for medium roast and prepared over the stove top, but percolators can work over any heated surface, even a campfire. Um, so next you have the single serve that has been popping up for the last few years. You measure out your desired coffee amount, pour into a reusable filter, pour water in, and voila. Um, scratch that, I don't know how to say that word very properly. A cup of coffee just for you will be ready soon or pop in a pod. Single serve coffee makers are perfect for a single person household or those where just one person drinks coffee. So next you have your standard drip drew to get your brew going in a drip coffee maker. All you have to do is scoop your coffee, pour into a filter, pour some water in and press start to let the drip coffee maker do its coffee magic. Next you have a pour over. A pour-over coffee maker is exactly what it sounds like. You manually pour hot water over the beans. Fans love the fact that you get to control the strength of the coffee, plus the pots are super easy to clean. You do need a special kind of filter, though, which is pricier than the typical drip coffee filter. Filter, However, some are reusable. Code brew. Um, cold brew is one of my favorites, one that's very easy to do. Use a cold brew maker. Um, the one on the right is the one that I have at home. It's very, very easy to use. Um, so you throw in your coffee grounds. You usually want to use a coarser ground, like I stated before, but you can really use any coffee grounds. Brew and serve. You can store the coffee up for up to 36 hours. I like to add a splash of milk or creamer to mine. So next, let's move into the health side of coffee. I'm um, combating the negative effects. I um, drink coffee in moderation like you do with most things in your life. Consuming more than five cups per day may result in adverse health effects. Um, so these next few slides are taken directly from the publication um, 
that goes along with this lesson. So many studies have explored the health benefits and risk of coffee. These are a few of the findings. So you have diabetes. Coffee may lower the risk of type 2 diabetes for men and women. Decaf coffee has the same effects as regular coffee, but watch out for added sugars. Cardiovascular health. Coffee filters remove the lipid-raising agents in coffee. Instant coffee does not contain the lipid-raising agents. So you want to really look for a coffee machine or the way you make your coffee um, using some kind of filter. So it'll help if you're looking out for those lipid-raising agents. So higher consumption of coffee, so more than those five cups per day, is linked with higher blood lipid levels. Um, blood pressure, coffee may result in a short-term increase in blood pressure. However, no long-term increase occurs in blood pressure in individuals with or without high blood pressure when they consume coffee in moderation. Individuals with uncontrolled high blood pressure should avoid large amounts of coffee because this can increase blood pressure. Metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions that are linked with the development of heart disease and type 2 diabetes, including obesity, dyslipidemia, which is abnormal blood lipid levels, high blood pressure, and increased blood sugar. Coffee contains complex molecules that assist in preventing cardiovascular events and high blood sugar. Parkinson's disease. Coffee may reduce or delay disease development and improve symptom management of Parkinson's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disorder. According to some research, caffeine in coffee protects part of the brain affected by the disease. Osteoporosis. Moderate caffeine consumption of three to five cups of coffee per day is not linked with harming bones. According to some research, adding one to two tablespoons of milk to your cup of coffee offsets the osteoporotic risk of coffee. A calcium-rich diet includes consuming 1,000 milligrams of calcium for individuals younger than the age of 50 and 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day for individuals older than 50. So caffeine. Caffeine is found naturally in coffee, tea, dark chocolate, and a variety of other foods and beverages. Caffeine is a central nervous system stimulant. It can also help fight fatigue, boost physical endurance, and enhance mental abilities and mood. Some of the potential problems with excess ingestion of caffeine are irritability, insomnia, and anxiety. Caffeine passes from the mother to an infant in small amounts through breast milk but usually does not adversely affect the infant when the mother consumes low to moderate amounts, about 300 milligrams of less per, of milligrams of caffeine or less per day, which is about two to three cups of coffee. It's typically safe for healthy adults to consume 400 milligrams of caffeine daily. Beverages containing caffeine should be avoided for children younger than age two. Concerns exist about potential negative health effects on caffeine for younger children and no safe limits of caffeine have been established for this age group. Coffee is the main dietary source of caffeine for adults, followed by soft drinks, tea, and chocolate. Certain, currently, the average amount of caffeine in an adult's diet is about 200 milligrams per day. Despite many years of research, caffeine's effects on health are still unclear. Caffeine does not cause any physical harm to most people who consume moderate amounts. No scientific evidence has linked caffeine to developing any of the following health risks, cancers, cardiovascular disease, ulcers, inflammatory bowel disease, fibrocystic breast disease, birth defects, infertility, or osteoporosis. So how much is too much of caffeine? Um, some herbal supplements can interact with caffeine. Several medications can interact with caffeine. Talk with your physician if you're worried. Tips to change your caffeine habit. Keep tabs. Read the food labels. Um, cut back gradually, which will help your body get used to the lower levels of caffeine and lessen potential withdrawal effects. Go decaf. Shorten the brew time. Or you could even go with an herbal tea. Check the bottle. Some of the over-the-counter pain relievers contain caffeine. Look for caffeine-free pain relievers instead. So the caffeine content in what we drink. So eight ounces of brewed coffee has 96 milligrams of caffeine. Brewed decaf has two milligrams of caffeine. Instant, caffe instant coffee has 62 milligrams of caffeine. Instant decaf, again, has two milligrams of caffeine. And so espresso, like I said, stated earlier, usually has one ounce to it. So a one ounce shot of espresso has 64 milligrams of caffeine. So really look out if you're trying to watch your caffeine consumption when you go 
buy those specialty coffee drinks. Decaf espresso has zero milligrams of coffee. So this is a little excerpt from the Dietary Guidelines, um, the new ones that came out last year. So when choosing beverages in a healthy dietary pattern, both the calories and nutrients that they provide are important, cons- are important considerations. Beverages that are calorie-free, especially water, or that contribute to beneficial nutrients such as fat-free and low-fat milk and 100% juice should be the primary beverages consumed. Coffee, tea, and flavored waters also are options, but the most nutrient-dense options for these beverages include little, if any, sweeteners or cream. So added sugars. We need to be mindful of how much added sugar is in our coffee. So anything you add to it, be it um, a flavored creamer, um, half and half, heavy whipping cream, any of milk, um, those add up. The table shows to your right that 11% of our total sugar intake comes from coffee and tea beverages. Sugar sweetened beverages like soda, sports drinks, energy drinks, fruit drinks, and sweetened coffee and teas um, contribute to over 40% of the daily intake of added sugars. So in conclusion, there is strong and consistent evidence that shows that consumption of coffee with within the moderate late range, so those three to five cups, or up to 400 milligrams of caffeine, is not associated with increased risk of major chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease and cancer and premature deaths in healthy adults. Hey friends, welcome back. And I talked a little bit about the recipes. So today I'm featuring four there are plenty to find, but four great plated up recipes that you can find at your local extension office. And um, those are the peachy breakfast bake, sorghum gingerbread pear muffins, blackberry coffee cake, and pumpkin apple muffins. These are just four great recipes that can be paired great with your morning coffee.